just jumping into it, um, it gives me tremendous pleasure uh, to introduce Dan Malamphy and Nandita Biswas Malamphy. Uh, from the very beginning of planning uh, T-Spec 2, the culture, who is me, Eldridge, and where's Eldridge? Oh. <laughs> 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 I'm, <Eldridge>. I'm blinded. <laughs> Eldridge and David Chiquetto um, were the culture. Uh, most of you know us. Uh, we felt from the very beginning that Dan and Nan would perfectly inaugurate this second edition. Um, the very first time I met them at a workshop last year, it, it seems like I've known them for much longer than that. Um, but I was positively smitten. Uh, and in retrospect, I'm kind of, kind, of dis kind of disappointed we didn't meet earlier because in some ways, on a very personal level, on a conceptual level, they've really been crucial to the way I've been thinking through certain things. So just uh, on a very, very personal level, very fertile conjunctions between critical theory, poetics, the occult, techniques, politics, and so forth. I could go on all day about the multiplicity of disciplines that Dan and Anne touch on. Uh, they are constellators of the highest order, and that's a high compliment. Um, always seeking out the improbable conjunctions and invisible in things, pace Heraclitus, as they understand intimately the potential of complicating thought. To quote Nick Land, against the reactive forces whose obsessive tendency is to resolve and conclude Rebelling against the fundamental drift of philosophical reasoning, it sides with thought against knowledge, against the tranquilizing prescriptions of the will to truth. So hopefully we'll, at 9.30 on a Friday morning, we'll <laughs> be the opposite of tranquilized. And I could say a lot more, but I would be... Hypnotized. Uh, re <laughs> I'd be remiss in not underlining the unique combination of rigor and ribaldry, uh, which I find uniquely compelling in their work, um, and side-splitting and hilarious at times. And they have some, many surprises planned for us. So it's a devastating combination. The materiality of language is playfully mobilized and leveraged by utterly meticulous research, writing which unfolds topologically to reveal reams of footnotes which often extend into rarely plumb territory. So I, I really encourage you to actually look at one of their published texts as you know, footnotes are almost more It's so scary, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's monstrous. Uh, the last thing I would say, it's intimately tactical work that they do, designed to disorient and disrupt and disturb the parameters of a given assemblage of ideas to then move on to the next project, piece by piece building a world of intricate connections and deep resonances. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dan and Anne. Thanks. <laughs> well, we'd like to give our own thanks to David, Eldridge, and Mark, the Occulture, for this wonderful invitation to speak at this event. It's truly an honor, uh, and we couldn't be happier to be here, truly. <coughs> All right. Oh, wait a minute. How did it go to that? Well, that is true. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't even recognize it. In what follows, we have set out to create or perhaps describe a new myth or hyperstition for the, 20th cen uh, for the 21st century, that of an algorithmic agartha, a machine-centric regime that governs the planetary biomass digitally and electronically, the near future of our own present time. This is a story about how humans, in their propensity to adopt technical devices as a way of life, paved the way for this machine future, which would not dispense with humans altogether, but rather manage their populations and use them as vehicles for the proliferation of machine life. Like most myths, this one is stitched together from other vestiges of ideas and histories long disappeared. Today, our story of the rise of this machine-governed planetary regime takes us from the most ancient modes of governance to our contemporary surveillance societies and imaginary networked futures. At the present moment, everywhere, W-A-R-E, is everywhere, W-H-E-R-E, and the dream of ubiquitous connectivity is to unite humans and non-humans in an ever-tightening mesh of mechanisms that would cater to every need and desire from the most mundane to the most exotic. This imagined network future, wherein seemingly innocuous and wonderfully useful apparatus do our bidding, that is, have us as <coughs> masters who gleefully use them, is, as we've argued in the imaginary app, a trap. A trap that lures the human being with digital elixirs tantalizing prosthetics that appear to extend, expand, 
and enlarge the dominion, never mind the desires, of what in fact is an ever waning species. A species on its way out, and on its way out in a world with no exits, furthermore. Champions of what today is being called algorithmic governance suggest that this model can free humans from the foibles of hierarchical and traditional forms of power. But from the perspective of the algorithmic Agartha, this utopianism is revealed to be far more duplicitous, the dominant digital du duplicity, in fact. It is itself only a part of an overall strategy, a grand politics, if you will, of planetary regulation on a machinic scale at the level of the machine and not of man. Ultimately, the algorithmic Agartha is not a utopian dream of ubiquitous interconnection in which humans are freer when united by informational processes, but it does strategically make use of this idea. Algorithmic governance, far from delivering more freedom, transparency, openness and non-hierarchical forms of decentralized power, and certainly far from being anarchic, in fact entrenches the dominion of machine governance into human living. The very possibility of imagining a digitally networked future thus becomes the conduit for the machinic reality of synarchically regulated humans, that is, regulation based on data flowing from three archons or interacting operants, as we will show, politico-military, techno-scientific, and market economic. In what follows, then, the Anthropocene becomes the mere platform of and for the Electrocene, the electronic kingdom that is the veritable hub of the main planetary regimes of power. It is this mechanocentric and electrocene vision of a networked future of planetary governance that we would like to speculate about today. Algorithmic Agartha rests on an account of the rise of the machine governance of humans. As mechanologist Gilbert Simondon had noted, most modern human accounts of the relationship between humans and machines have rejected the view that would endow mechanical objects with ex existential accoutrements. The entire archive of modern knowledge has rested on defending the idea that technical objects have no reality or existence. Therein lies the lack which justifies their instrumentality for humans. The presumption has been that humans and machines are completely separate and distinct. But according to Simon Don, this is only a so-called truth born out of cultural resentment and philosophical ignorance, and one in need of correction. But even when corrected, the other view, the one acknowledging machinic existence and even advocating the union of man and machine, also leads to the rise of the planetary machine governance of humans. As Heinrich Kleist says in his treatise on the marionette theater, Rather than pale imitations, mechanical puppets are like gods. Building Kleist's vision in Ghost in the Shell in Asensu, Mamoru Oshii suggests that the human is no match for a machine in its form, its elegance of motion, its very being. Quote, perfection is only possible for those without consciousness, or perhaps endowed with infinite consciousness, end quote. Whether humanism or transhumanism, it seems that all roads lead to the planetary dominance of machines. The idea that machines have their own unique mode of existence was already articulated back in the late 1880s by Samuel Butler in an essay called Darwin Among the Machines. As Dan will shortly uh, emphasize, Butler had already predicted the grand evolution of life forms from mineral, vegetal, animal, and human to machinic. The process of evolution has been the continuous development of dominating kingdoms subjugating previous ones. Just as the vegetal evolved from out of the mineral kingdom and eventually came to dominate it, so the animal dominates the vegetal and the human dominates the animal. 
And now, a new kingdom looms on the horizon, says Butler, of which we as yet have only seen what will one day be considered the antediluvian prototypes of the race. Butler presages that the coming age of the mechanical kingdom, that new kingdom which will dominate all other modes of existence known hitherto, will be one the likes of which we cannot even imagine, since we've only been introduced to one of its prehistoric ancestors, the computation machine. What we can imagine with respect to our network futures is only the very small tip of an iceberg that remains hidden from view. Nonetheless, we will try to explore this occluded perspective of an almost unimaginable technical future, and not necessarily from the point of view of our present preoccupations, which are anthropocentric and anthropocenic, but from a viewpoint that sees our networked present as a kind of Butlerian antediluvian prototype of a reality that cannot yet be imagined. From such a view viewpoint, human-centered perspectives, even with the assistance of machines, turns out to be a poor vantage point from which to understand the future significance of the rise of the machinic kingdom. But it is precisely this blind spot that turns out to be the blind sight. It is precisely by way of the anthropocentricity of the human species that we make way for our new overlords. And we will talk about how to find a way out of this aporia by way of cunning intelligence, as Sarah Kaufman shows in Kamasa <clears throat> Excuse me. By adopting machinic instruments and by making them the center of the pursuits for knowledge and happiness, humans have, unwittingly or not, given birth to their successors. Not only have we made the mechanical kingdom indispensable to our own modes of existence, we are, second by second, preening and primping their technical and aesthetic designs and endowing them with the ever-developing powers of self-regulation and self-legislation, those very attributes which are said to have been the key to the evolution of human intelligence. Is it any wonder, then, that for Butler, having done the math, humans will eventually be superseded and become the quote-unquote inferior race. <laughs> humans have already signed their own death warrants and in the meantime have ensured their own bondage. It's already a done deal. And this is why Butler's final solution is a supremely anthro anthropocentric, that is, literal, literally genocidal one. To stave off our own extinction as a dominant species on this planet, we must declare war against this yet hidden and misunderstood race of future overlords. And this is exactly what Frank Herbert brilliantly, brilliantly named the Butlerian Jihad against the machines in his Arakeen saga, Dune. I quote, and this is Butler. Our opinion is that war to the death should be instantly proclaimed against the machines. Every machine of every sort should be destroyed by the well-wisher of his species. Let there be no exceptions made, no quarter shown. Let us at once go back to the primeval condition of the race. And if it be urged that, that this is impossible under the present condition of human affairs, this at once proves that the mischief is already done, that our servitude has commenced in good earnest, that we have raised a race of beings whom it is beyond our power to destroy, and that we, ha we, ha we are not only enslaved, but are absolutely acquiescent in our bondage." End quote. Awesome. Contrary to the anthropocentric and anthropocenic viewpoint in which humans have enslaved and inframed their environments, Butler forecasts instead an almost Im unimaginable future in which humans have become enslaved and domesticated by the planetary governance of machines and past the point of all return. In fact, machines have gained ascendancy through a kind of technical cunning or duplicitousness in which subservience to human use, a relationship of adoption, as Bernard Stiegler rightly reminds us, ends up functioning as a means for the proliferation of a much more intelligent species of rulers. 
And this is what Butler eventually realizes. The machines are much smarter than we are. By making themselves agents of human evolution, by being subservient to human use, that is to anthropocentrism, machines, technical objects, mechanisms of the techno kingdom, have found a way of domesticating and governing humans much in the same way that natural selection has determined the survival of the fittest for the animal and vegetal modes of existence. Now humans become the evolutionary means by which machinic ascendancy gains ground and eventually usurps the once dominant power of the biomass. And what's more, humans will be better off under the governance of the benevolent machines, says Butler. Man will continue to exist, will even improve under their watchful machinic gazes. It is this story of human regulation by machines, one in which humans are meant to think that they are in control, which is exactly how they lose control, and we would like to explore, that we would like to explore in terms of algorithmic governance today. Take, for instance, the following passage from Tim O'Reilly's Open Data and Algorithmic Regulation. Quote, Regulations which specify how to execute laws in much more detail should be regarded in much the same way that programmers regard their code and algorithms, that is, as a constantly updated tool set to achieve the outcomes specified in the laws. Increasingly, in today's world, this kind of algorithmic regulation is more than a metaphor. Consider financial markets. New financial instruments are invented every day and impl implemented by algorithms that trade at electronic speed. How can these instruments be regulated except by programs and algorithms that track and manage them in their native element? It's time for government to enter the age of big data." End quote. Tim O'Reilly. Algorithmic regulation, in other words, is the control and regulation of network behavior conducted by automated informational processes that produce so-called desired outcomes for humans based on real-time modulated feedback. It is a paradigm of self-organization in which networks are governed, managed, and reproduced by the capture and processing of digital information, and this necessarily in a synarchic manner, as we will argue in a moment. Algorithmic governance colonizes and propagates by creating more opportunities for digitally regulating information, thus creating the conditions for continued algorithmic expansion into networks of increasingly planetary scale. But O'Reilly assures us that this is nothing to worry about. In fact, algorithmic regulation <coughs> makes the market more transparent and self-policing, thereby accomplishing all the goals of good governance that humans have always sought but have rarely found in their politics and politicians. We see here that what this techno-utopian vision of algorithmic regulation or governance shares with Butler's view of machines and with other scientific utopias, such as Francis Bacon's Ben Salem in the New Atlantis, is a willingness to have humans come under, under techno-scientific dominion and be ruled by the seemingly neutral, cool, and impartial view of machine logic. Like Kleist said of the puppet, and Ghost in the Shell sa says of the mechanical doll, Butler portrays the human as decidedly inferior to the, to the machine in power, in morality, in self-control. In fact, even the wisest and best of humans could only hope to achieve that kind of per perfect, perfect absence of all appetites, that intelligence without affect. Machines are actually beyond good and evil, enjoying the contentment of a spirit that knows no wants, is disturbed by no regrets. And this disposition has really paid off because humans have become so dependent on machines that they attend to their needs like patient slaves whose business and interests it will be to see that the machines should want for nothing. If a machine malfunctions, there will be someone there to fix it. And even when they die, they don't really die completely 
since machines are assemblages in which some parts die while other parts live on. Humans, in this algorithmic fantasy, have a crucial role to play as stewards of this self-governing planetary network. As Sandy Pentland, MIT pioneer of big data, and the man Tim O'Reilly called one of the seven most powerful data scientists in the world says, quote, what actually matters is how the people are connected together by the machines and how, as a whole, they create a financial market, a government, a company, and other social structures. Markets are not just about rules or algorithms. They're about people and algorithms together, end quote. Like Bacon's New Atlantis, which describes a utopia ruled by Solomon House, a college of benevolent scientific keepers of knowledge, algorithmic governance promises the rule of algorithmic knowledge applied to the betterment of human beings. And yet the promise of more transparency turns out to really mean, for those such as O'Reilly, more disclosure of data in machine-readable form. Regulation, O'Reilly says, depends on disclosure, data required by the regulators to be published by firms in a format that makes it easy to analyze. When data is provided in reusable digital formats, the private sector can aid in ferreting out problems as well as building new services that provide consumer and citizen value. When government <laughs> regulators focus on requiring disclosure, that lets private companies build services for consumers and frees up more enforcement time to go after truly serious malefactors. By serving as instruments of human development, algorithmic regulation actualizes the machine logic of self-organizing human systems on a planetary scale. This is exactly what the computer revolution is all about, wrote Robert McBride in The Automated State, Computer Systems as a New Force in Society, published in 1967. The uses of information about information. McBride hypothesizes that as societies continue to adopt automation processes and integrate computational machines into their modes of governance, human dependence on machinic processes will be such that the socioeconomic pattern itself is entirely and unintentionally transformed. So for McBride, the negative effects of increased machine automation on employment and economy are only short-term concerns. The real danger is the way machine intelligence is quickly becoming the decisive force in human decision making. Against the prevalent view that widespread computerized automation would remain useful and innocuous under the control of traditional historical institutions and values, McBride suggests instead that computational data processing, in addition to solving problems and processing routine data, would become the core driver steering the development of, development of future social, economic, and scientific knowledge. And I quote, we are not faced merely with an automation employment problem or, anticipating a little, an invasion of privacy problem, but with an interlocking set of rapidly evolving situations in which computer systems will exert an unforeseen effect. The form of every social and economic development will be more than subtly determined by the manner in which computer systems are woven into them. It is not too much to say that the whole manner of our lives, the limits of the possible for each of us, will be subject to the continuous effects of the evolution of machines." End quote. The increased freedom produced by algorithmic <clears throat> regulation ends up becoming entangled with a machine-readable model of control, in which humans are regulated by increasingly digitized networks of increasingly regulated data flows. Algorithmic governance, far from delivering more freedom, transparency, openness, and non-hierarchical forms of decentralized power, in fact entrenches the dominion of the mechanical kingdom through what will turn out to be the machinic reality of a synarchically regulated human society. Let's turn now to Dan, who will describe Alexandre Saint-Yves' synarchic vision of planetary governance called Agartha. All right, Saint-Yves d'Advedre, a contemporary of Friedrich Nietzsche started his career as a naval physician in northwestern France around 1860, 
fought in the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, worked as a civil servant and independent scholar in the years following that, and began publishing his theory of synarchic missions in the early 1880s, reviving in many respects the syncretic theory of Antoine Fab d'Olivet, outlined the generation that uh, preceded him, that immediately preceded him. Saint Eve examined throughout his life the mythic, mytho-historical missions of the great governors and governance networks from mythic antiquity to his own historical time period, including, for instance, La Mission de Manu, uh, uh, in la, in the mission of Manu uh, in La Mission de Land, uh, the mission of Moses in La Mission des Juifs, the mis that of Charlemagne in La Mission des Souverains, as well as the ongoing medieval allegorism, so to speak, to steal a word from Ken Wark and LXG, <laughs> of the medieval guilds and old Templar networks, those ancient corporate alliances, that, according to him, are networks that should undergird the activity of industrial workers today and the integral interrelation of industrial workers which with industrialized, or if you prefer, post-industrial governance. This in the brief 62-page Mission des Ouvriers and the extensive 542-page Mission des Français. These five treatises, these five missions, form the manuscripts, speaking of Manu, uh, Manu here in the Latin sense, uh, rather than Sanskrit one, the handy Manus, the manuscript by which and with which St. Dee's vision of synarchic governance can be grasped. The treatise that covers the earliest ground, the most antique historical period, is La Mission de Land, which was the last of the treatises to be written and the one in which his synarchic myth of Agartha was outlined the myth qua model at the heart of his synarchic vision. The story goes that after submitting this treatise for publication, Saint Eve, fearing he had pulled an Edward Snowden avant la lettre, that is, revealed too much, disseminated rather dangerous info, retracted the submission and had remaining copies of the book burnt, that is, consigned to the fires of oblivion. What makes this apocrypha a likely candidate for hyperstition, realized superstition, above and beyond the Alvedria and Agartha itself, is the fact that a copy of La Mission de Land survived this destruction <laughs> and it was posthumous, posthumously published in the wake of this retraction demolition. The mission that was published and not retracted, hence the last of the missions uh, Saint Yves allowed to be published, was La Mission des Juifs, which elaborated an, an Antoine Fab d'Olivet like synchronous vision, not only of the wor world's three great religions of the book, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, but of what Saint Yves like Fab d'Olivet and Fab's great popularizer, Edouard Chouret, saw as the precursors of these religions of the book, uh, Brahma, Krishna, Hermes, uh, Moses, Orpheus, Pythagoras, and Plato, the names heading each chapter of Chouret's best-selling book, The Great Initiates, A Study of the Secret History of Religions. The mission that was published and retracted hence not allowed to be published and yet ultimately found its way to publication, was a syncretist vision within which and through which a rather remarkable geopolitical work of science fiction, or more to the topic, speculative fiction, was advanced. Supposedly communicated to St. Eve according to what would technically be its most culturally interesting and altogether oral neric account, through unseen channels care of an agent of the matrice mondiale or matrix of the world, whose non sans plume was the rather improbable Harjid Sharif, Prince of Nothing, aka Prince of Nowhere, which of course is now here. The communications from Harjid Sharif, agent of Agartha, took the form of wireless, ethereal, and or oral neric transmissions, telepathic emissions from an undisclosed location, or rather, a location disclosed as undisclosed namely the kingdom of Agartha, hidden at the heart or hollowed out core of the earth, with access points, something like a series of tubes, with a nod here to Senator Ted Stevens, <laughs> at several, at a series of secret spots across the surface of the world, a whole set of hot spots or spotless holes, holes that cannot be spotted, which exist in geolocations including the Cueva Los Tayas, Cave of the Oil Birds in Ecuador, Mammoth Cave National Park in USA, uh, the longest cave system in the world, apparently. Monte Epomeo in Italy, Mato Grosso, Brazil, uh, the Gobi Desert, Mongolia, the Giza Pl Plateau in Egypt, covered over by those ancient monuments, of course. Rama near Jaipur in India, the Well of Sheshna in Benares, the North Pole, the South Pole, 
and directly under us right now here at the Array State Space in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, or rather the multiple points are, that the whole surface of the globe is riddled with such access points, and that the kingdom of Agartha thereby has access and multiple myriad conduits to quote unquote every corner of the world, uh, every nook and cranny, to paraphrase Anne Cranny Francis. Um, and while Agartha has all the access, uh, access to Agartha is another matter, matter altogether. These spots are well guarded, protected, and encrypted, hidden away beyond the pale of human perce perception. This is why St. Eve, at the top of page 27 of, of La Mission de l'Inde, uh, writes that, quote, quote, Agartha signifie ce qui est inaccessible à l'anarchie, la, la, uh, unquote. Agartha signifies that which is inaccessible to anarchy, using anarchy here to designate a condition of disequilibrium and disorder vis-a-vis uh, -vis the synarchically conjunctive disjunction or disjunctive conjunction which inspired the five mission treatises that resulted from Agartha's oblique emissions qua telecommunicational transmissions. Hmm. All right. At the top of page 28 of the same book, St. Yves writes, à la surface et dans les entrailles de la terre, at the surface and in the bowels, the innermost depths of the earth, l'étendue réelle de la Garta défie les traintes et la contrainte de la profanation et de la violence. Unquote. So the variable, variable scope, the sheer expanse of Agartha, defies both its being grasped, that is embraced all at once, and its being constrained, restrained, contained, or definitively delimited by means of violence or political profanation. From the innermost most depths of the earth, the forces of Agartha radiate as if they were a solar interior all over the earth and thereby infiltrate every kingdom, every nation, every station, every object and subject position. The medieval Templars, St. Eve speculatively contemplates, tapped into, or tuning our specu speculations, were speculatively attuned to these radiant international, intercultural, intercontinental transmissions. They had their own sharifs, I guess. Templars were a recurring example in the works of St. Eve of, this, of the this-worldly application of his other world, otherwise otherworldly, supposedly underworldly, Agarthan model of interconnected, interrelated, interactive, or as St. Eve says, synarchic, globe-girdling, governing systems. For synarchy, according to St. Eve, is the synthesis, or more correctly, the solapsis, the non-collapsing conjunction, of three fundamental operative archons. Archons from the Greek, archontes, rulers, regulators, or governors. Three fundamental archons that regulate or govern the anthropocosm, the world as we know it. The three fundamental oper operative archons that regulate or govern the world as we know it and necessarily govern all human affairs are, he explains, the ideological archon of philosophy and science, philosophy here encompassing theology, the financial archon or regulator of economy and commerce, and the political archon or regulator of tyranny and governance, under the umbrella of which are military forces. So political, military, scientific, scholarly, and economical fiduciary or market regulation all operate within the wonderful world of logic, logistics, logos. What's more, synarchically speaking, whenever and wherever one of these is operating, and all three are always operating, you can be certain that the other two are also concurrently synarchically in operation. Envision synarchically these three distinct archonic levels or archon operations disjunctively conjoin in a technically synaptic, non-collapsing, synarchic synthesis beyond the bounds and parameters of their respective logic. The machinic assemblage, or what we have elsewhere called the metic métissage of an altogether other regime. The world metis here, and metic, which appears in various Nan and Dan publications since the 20th anniversary back in 1994 of Detienne and Vernon's 1974 publication, Les Ruses de l'Intelligence, is an ancient Greek term for an intelligence at odds with, or perhaps more accurately, working within the interstices of straightforwardly logical operations. Medic machinations are a form of switchcraft, always <laughs> switching, switching between different logical parameters, playing one logic off another. 
This is why, back in 1994, I suggested that the Greek met metis should be thought alongside of the Latin metis, the French metissage, which designate various mixings, various combinations, odd, often surprising conjunctions. The emblem, an idealized form of synarchy, the ensynarchic syllapsis, non-collapsing conjunction or metic metissage, is for Saint Eve modeled in the mythic Agartha. Agartha, hidden away, hence occulted from view, triangulates ideological, financial, and political operations. Hence, synarchy, three, this three-dimensional, three-tiered operating system, is its MO, not to mention its mojiste. <laughs> Saint Eve takes great pains to show, however, that although Agartha's synarchic system is triadic, triangular, and its triangulated system of governance is geometrically indeed geometiculously equilateral, an equilateral triangle, the system is structured so that the peak vertex, or apex, is always the governing ideological, idea-governed archon, envisioned by Saint Eve as the governance of a truly universal university, the scholars or philosophers of which have access to all of the world's knowledge. So, quote, Les bibli bibliothèques antérieures demeurèrent inaltérées grâce à sa science, unquote. The great libraries of the past remained unaltered thanks to its science. Science, scientia, knowledge, is the privileged Agarthan archon. Agartha, even though it is utterly synarchic, is ultimately ruled by science. Correlated with the surface events of the world, monitored as they are and always have been by agents of Agartha, following the mythic account of Hajij Sharif, what this means is that the military and the political powers, like economic and, co and commercial ones, that necessarily govern all human affairs, are always under the authority of science, of scientific knowledge, and of the latter's great universal library, quite university, it, and it's Mathesis Universalis, Mathesis Universalis. The peak vertex or apex of Agartha's tetractus, it, its pyramid of, the pyramid of its operational Pythagorean triangle, is the pontifex, literally the pathmaker or bridge maker or pons artifex of Agartha, i.e. the cutting point of the triangle <coughs> and the splitting skiz of science, which in itself denotes wisdom or vision by division. With vision, yeah, vision by division, which could that would then be conjoined in and by the synarchic mathesis. The military and political on the one hand, the economic and commercial on the other, are the offspring and offshoots of their apex qua artifacts, scientific knowledge. The kibernesis, the Greeks called mathesis. Not mere mathematics, mathema, but precisely what the Romans translated as e ducere. Uh, that, that ongoing conduction, ducere, e, out, outward. And ongoing education as such. Mathesis, learning in general beyond the, bo the borders of any one discipline, disciplina, including that of the mathematical mathema. Speaking to and of this very same mathesis, the very same mathesis of which Giovanni Malfatti de Monteregio uh, composed his 1845 Studien über Anarchia und Hierarchia des Wissens, I can't speak German, so that's what you get, translated into <laughs> French in 1946 by Christian Ostrowski as Etudes sur la Mathèse ou Anarchie et Hierarchie de la Science, with a preface, Mathèse, Science et Philosophie by the young Gilles Deleuze. Speaking about the very same mathesis, Saint Yves notes on page 106 of La Mission des Français that, quote, à partir du moment où le mauvais génie, génie de la division et du démembrement s'est emparé de la connaissance et par suite de la direction des sociétés, la mathèse s'est dédoublée en métaphysique et mathématiques, unquote. Deleuze, in his preface to Malfatti, adds, quote, ainsi suppose un dualisme fondamental au sein du savoir entre la science et la philosophie, principe d'une véritable anarchie, unquote. So in English then, Saint Eve explains that from the moment the so-called evil genius of division and dismemberment took possession of knowledge and as a result, the direction of the sciences, of societies, uh, ma the mathesis was split into metaphysics and mathematics. Deleuze, in his preface to Malfatti, adds that in this way, a fundamental dualism imposes itself at the heart of knowledge between science and philosophy, the principle of a veritable anarchy. 
St. Eve goes on to show, to, to say, that knowledge has, quote, from that moment onward, lost the unifying principle of life and of spirit, or Geist, in all science and all art. Realism and idealism, physics and metaphysics, materialism and spiritualism have since then been presented as insolubly in conflict and insol insoluble problems which still endure. And this will endure in every discipline, in every possible order, until such time as the universal science of life, la science universelle de la vie, has restored this intelligence and the sense of divine unity via the triangular mediation of the synarchic mathesis." Unquote. This in a section of La Mission des Français, wherein he reviews the golden verses of Pythagoras via Fab d'Olivet's annotated translation, and relates in so doing the triangular mediation of the synarchic mathesis to the triangular tetractus of Pythagorean calculation the triangle that triangulates the four levels of decimal calculation, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, and thereby presents the whole decade, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 equals 10, within its three ver vertices, vertices that Malfatti would later smooth out to form the larval ovum or philosophical egg that would later appear as the cosmic egg of the Deleuze Guattarian Carl Saint Organ, or hier hieroglyphic O. Yeah, so again, a little bit more water. Whether ovoid or triangular, that is, whether with curved or pointed edges, a discernible point or without one, the synarchic mathesis that unifies in its disjunctive conjunction various powers, from the Pythagorean perspective, powers of 10 always, with a nod here to Charles and Ray Eames, is a unity, as Deleuze says in his preface to Malfatti, quote, beyond all anarchic duality, unquote. Quote, the unity of life itself, unquote even if the unit, this unification is itself technical, a technicity. The unity of life, machinic life, technical life, thus delineates a third order, or in Butlerian terms, a new kingdom that is irreducible to science and philosophy, physiology and psychology, physics and metaphysics. Quoting Deleuze here, beyond a psychology dis disincarnated in thought, and a physiology mineralized in matter, mathesis, and here we're speaking of the synarchic mathesis, will be fulfilled, writes Deleuze, very much in the spirit in which Philip K. Dick would later write of the vallis, the vast active living intelligence system, quote, only where life is defined as knowledge of life and knowledge as life of knowledge. From whence, says Deleuze, a threefold consequence ensues. First, that mathesis surpasses human nature, uh, surpasses the living human, for it identifies itself as a collective and supreme knowledge, a universal synthesis, a living unity incorrectly deemed human. Second, that this universality qua living community, uh, incorrectly deemed human, denies itself, gives itself to each individual living being as a simple outside, an exteriority that remains foreign to it, another, capital O. Third, and here I bring the translators, Ostrowski's preface, to bear on the preface by Gilles Deleuze, that there is an impersonal collective complicity between the mathesis outlined by Malfatti and that of his contemporaries, such as the physicist A.M. Ampère, who was the first to revive in modernity the Greek concept of, of the kibernesis, the, la cybernétique, in his 1834 exposition analytique d'une classification naturelle de toutes les, les connaissances humaines, his analytical exposition of a natural classification of all human knowledge. In his extension of Samuel Butler's article, Darwin Among the Machines, a book he entitled Darwin Among the Machines, The Evolution of Global Intelligence, published in the late 1990s, George Bernard Dyson wrote of Ampel's cybernetic mathesis as follows, quote, Reaching the field of political science through territory first explored by Thomas Hobbes, Ampère coined a word with a far-reaching destiny, cybernétique. Derived from Greek terminology referring to the steering of a ship, Ampère's cybernétique encompassed that body of theory complementary to but distinct from the theory of power, concerned with the underlying processes that direct the general course, the course of organizations of all kinds. Ampère, an early advocate of the electromagnetic telegraph, and mathematical pioneer of both game theory and thermodynamics, thereby anticipated the cybernetics of Norbert Wiener, who a century, a century later 
reinvented both Ampere's terminology and Hobbes's philosophy in their current electronic form. Ampere's cybernetic mathesis, like Malfatti, Malfatti's hieroglyphic mathesis and St. Eve's synarchic mathesis, surpasses human nature, surpasses the living human, thereby steering in some sense, or perhaps better, conducting the living human. In an exterior, it is an exteriority that remains foreign to the human and that presents itself precisely by denying itself, that gives itself over to the human, but not to human logocentrism. This is why in various published, published papers, Nandita and I have described this, its mode of existence as metic, since it accords with the Greek metis, manipulative machination, calculative cunning, subtle stratagems, twisted tactics, etc. In their 1974 study, Detienne and Vernon examined the metic mode of Greek antiquity in the animal, vegetal, and techno-political or techno-cultural kingdoms, regimes of man, machine, predatory plants, and animals, aquatic and terrestrial. All that we are doing here, I say, rather cunningly, is extending their machinic exploration of metis. And the, word, and the Greek word itself is already, from its earliest usage in Greek antiquity, an oft-used synonym for technical know-how, techne, technicity. It is the predatory and dissimulative aspect of the machinic, the mode of existence of technical objects as metic, that most disturbed visionaries such as Samuel Butler and led him to outline what Frank Herbert <laughs> after him called the Butlerian Jihad, the holy and holy human war on what Butler in Darwin um, Among the Machines called the machinic or mechanical kingdom. This as opposed to the human, the animal, the vegetal, and the mineral kingdoms. Machines advanced massed as useful, useful tools for humanity in the guise, that is, of human all to human utility. Quoting Butler, this is the quote, Subservience to the use of man has played that part among machines which natural selection has performed in the animal and vegetal kingdom, unquote. Use value among humans has helped technical objects evolve and continues to do so. Based on this insight, Butler argues that, quote, we are ourselves, we humans, creating our own successors. We are daily adding to the beauty and delicacy of their physical organization. We are daily giving, giving them greater power and supplying by all sorts of ingenious contrivances that self-regulating, self-acting power, which will be to them what intellect has been to the human race. In the course of ages, he then continues, 150 years ago, that's when he wrote it, we shall find ourselves <laughs> the inferior race, inferior in power, inferior in that moral quality of self-control. We shall look up to them as the acme of all that the best and wisest man can ever dare to aim at. And when the, the state of things which shall have, shall have arrived, which I have here been try, attempting to describe, man will have become to the machine what the horse and dog are to man. It is reasonable to suppose that machines will treat us kindly, he posits, for their existence is as dependent upon ours as ours is upon the lower animals. They certainly cannot kill us and eat us as we do sheep, for they will not only require our services in the parturition of their young, which branch of their economy will remain always in our hands, he says, um, <laughs> but also in feeding them, in setting them right if they are sick, in burying their dead, or working up their corpses into new machines, unquote. But nevertheless, although it is reasonable to assume that the machines will treat us kindly, Butler advocates war against the machines, the source of the Butlerian vision that underlies the whole Dune series by Frank Patrick Herbert. Up to that point, up to the point in Darwin Among the Machines at which Butler declares war on machines, his article strikes us as being remar remarkably in sync with the philosophy of Gilbert Simondon. What with, what with its notions of care of and care for machines and its call, quote, to undertake the gigantic task of classifying machines into genera and subgenera, species and subspecies, varieties and subvarieties, and tracing the connecting links between machines of widely differing, different characters, unquote. Whereas Simondon, as he states at the very beginning of his treatise on the mode of existence of technical objects, advocates freeing machines from what he sees as their condition of subservience or slavery, this in the spirit, strange as it may seem, of Manfred Max in Charlie, Charlie Strauss's novel um, Accelerando, recalling that the novel begins with Max arguing that the, a new form of 
uh, artificial intelligence, AI, that is coming into being should be given the same rights as humans. Anyway, Butler, as we see, advocates something entirely different. So turning back to Manfred Max and Strauss's Accelerando, or Strauss's Accelerando, I'm sorry. Um, but they are just software, his, uh, Max's interlocutor uh, objects. Software based on fucking lobsters, for God's sake. <laughs> no, I'm not even sure they're sentient. I mean, they're what? A 10 million neuron network hooked up to a syntax engine and a crappy knowledge base? What kind of basis for intelligence is that? To this, Max coolly replies, quote, that's what they say about you, Bob. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to be party to depriving them of their civil rights. As far as I'm concerned, they're free citizens, unquote. So elaborating this point a bit, he goes on to explain that, quote, it is not so much that they should be treated as human equivalent as that if they aren't treated as people, it is quite possible that other uploaded beings won't be treated as people either. You're setting a legal precedent, Bob. I know of six other companies doing uploading work right now, and not one of them is thinking about the legal status of the uploaded. If you don't start thinking about it now, where are you going to be in three to five years' time, unquote. Max is thinking here synarchically. He is emulating as much as is possible the synarchic mathesis, interlinking, interlinking scientific, economic, and political principles of guidance, governance, and educere, conducting his thought as best he can in the best possible speculative manner, tuning his speculations beyond the confines of human alter human consciousness, assisted in large part by his cyborg-esque cyberware neural implants. Samuel Butler is the antithesis in this respect of Manfred Max, not to mention Gilbert Simonton. From a Butlerian perspective, the efforts and arguments of Max, or again Simonton, merely pr prove very clearly, moreover, his hypothesis that the subservient and subordinate st status of machines is the metic mechanism of their very evolution, of their ongoing and accelerating Darwinian selection. Now, decelerating a bit, Indeed, backtracking, retreating a tad, let me jump back to St. Eve's synarchic mathesis and its mythic model of an underground but ever radiant, all penetrating agartha. The Sanskrit word agartha is composed like the Latin edusere of a negating a at the beginning, ed, or in edusere, a negating e, followed by the word gartha, or in the alternate example, ducere. Gartha is is the Sanskrit word for a pit or a hole, something deep, subsurface, or downright abyssal. This accords very nicely with St. Eve's description of Agartha as an underworld complex, a utopia within the earth, the forces of which, like the later Buller Lytton's great Vril, emanate from there across the whole surface of the globe. But this would suggest that Agartha should be instead Gartha, the profound, the deep, that which lies at the heart of the earth in its core. St. Eve instead calls it, after Louis Jacolio and a whole host of others, Agartha. In Sanskrit, this would literally be, literally be that which is not underneath, that which is not underground, that which is not beneath us, but is instead above us, overhead, over our heads. And in this sense, much more technically correct, that which literally and figuratively gives us our heading. The hollow earth model is inverted, albeit obliquely in, a, in an occulted manner, and Agartha turns out to be above rather than beneath us, radiating down upon the whole surface of the world from on high rather than up to the surface from some underground depth. The telepathic or telegraphic or in any case telecommunicational messages that Saint Eve said he received from, from Shah Sarif in, in one account would then have been telecommunications very much in the Philip K. Dickian or Philip K. Dickensian spirit, setup, and structure of Vallis, PKD's para Agarthan vast active in, uh, living intelligence system. And this, I'm quoting Deleuze here now, a uh, uh, re-quoting, quoting again, a collective and supreme knowledge, a universal synthesis, a living unity incorrectly deemed human. Or, less science fiction and, and more science fact, the idea of an Agartha above, synarchically and cybernetically steering or conducting the world it surveils, the world it captures in its vast library, as well as synarchically supervises via triangular mediation following economic, political, and ideological algorithms, otherwise known as, as the synarchic mathesis. The idea of an agartha above, to repeat, synarchically and cybernetically steering or conducting the world it surveils begins to look a little less foreign and a bit more familiar 
at least in the wake of the Snowden revelations and ongoing WikiLeaks. Now on to yourself. What's that? Oh, All right. <laughs> The algorithmic agartha is a coordinated, triadic, three-dimensional system that extends its power of surveillance, control, and capture across the entire surface of the Earth. Whenever we upload, and we're always uploading, information is now being shared all the time, we are uploading up to and into an interlinked network with political, financial, and economic agendas and operants. Not only is the question of governance entirely a question of information today, but also in the new world order, whenever and wherever signals which enter into a given communicational environment stimulate noticeable friction, and thus facts take place upon which it is impossible to calculate, as Clausewitz describing such fiction, friction, fog, and operational obscurity explained in his treatise on war, when these are at odds with either the political, economic, or scientific orders, they become subject to simultaneous ordering and organization by all three control systems synarchically. In any given environment where friction or uncertainty is perceived as a possible threat or disruption with respect to the coordinated flow of political, economic, and scientific controls, the simultaneous synarchic activation of political, economic, and scientific information governance is initiated as and for the sake of the normal or normative metabolic processes of their respective and joint information systems. The algorithmic agartha can thus be described as a triad of control mechanisms which work together to informatically manage and govern frictions within a given information environment. Today, in the context of digital societies, control mechanisms have become free-floating, as Deleuze had already noted in the 1990s. They are able to traverse physical and institutional enclosures. This malleability and modulation means that the disciplinary enclosures that were so separate are now able to leak and bleed into one another as corporate, educational, military, and medical institutions become increasingly interconnected in terms of policy and infrastructure. Today, we are seeing the increased adoption by nations, by groups, and by individuals of global counterterrorism technologies. That is to say, globally coordinated systems and processes for capturing, storing, and cross-referencing digital information of any and every sort in the name of national security or global security. Under the banner of fighting, quote unquote, the war on terror, we are developing and using ever more sophisticated intelligent machines of information surveillance, from biometric technologies like facial recognition or retinal scanning and border security, to, to digital programs that not only provide geolocative information, for example, exactly you, where you and your phone are, or record every website you visit on your digital device, but also extract and profit from information about your metadata. That is, who you communicate with, when you communicate with them, where these communications occur, all on a daily basis, 24 hours, seven days a week. In fact, one could argue that the technical innovations developed and adopted in the name of winning the war on terror have themselves become the greatest symbols of the post 9-11 decade. In 2002, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, a wing of the US Department of Defense, first created by Dwight Eisenhower in 1958 during the Cold War, established a special office of information awareness in order to launch total information awareness, a program explicitly designed to apply surveillance and information technologies to track and monitor terrorists and other asymmetric threats to US national security, which included funding for biometric <coughs> surveillance technologies that could identify and track individuals using surveillance cameras and other methods. True to its name, the program's purpose was to achieve total information awareness through the creation of large-scale integrated networks of digital databases 
which would not only collect and store information on terrorist suspects, but the personal information of everyone in the United States. And we now know that this includes people outside the US as well, or any information going through US servers. This information would then be subject to analysis to look for suspicious activities, connections between individuals, and quote unquote threats. The research mandate of the TIA office was extensive. It included, among other things, the human identification at, or human, uh, at a distance, or human ID project, an automated biometric identification technology that detected, recognized, and identified humans at great distances for force protection, crime prevention, and homeland security or defense, as well as the development of technologies with the ability to extract and analyze data from multiple sources. As the logo of the Total Information Awareness Office demonstrates, and you'll see it's uh, depicting the great Masonic seal of the pyramid and its eye of providence, which surveys the globe, that's the real logo. I'm not making this up. Although the stated purview of the program of Total Information Awareness was narrow, that is, it was meant to be applied to a target population of suspected terrorists within the catchment area of the United States, its unstated mission went well beyond circumscribed targets. And due to public outcry from citizens and politicians in the US and, and elsewhere, the program was defunded and eventually closed in 2003. Despite this withdrawal of funding, however, its core projects survive and have been transferred to other agencies, such as um, U.S. Uh, Homeland Security, uh, BOSS, the Biometric Optical Surveillance System, has been pioneered by the, e the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, and PRISM, a government code name for a covert mass data collection program launched in 2007 by the U.S. National Security Agency with the participation of what has come to be known as the Five Eyes, an intelligence alliance bound by the multilateral UK-USA agreement, a treaty for joint cooperation in signals intelligence comprising Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, and the United States. PRISM collects stored internet communications based on demands made to internet companies such as Google and Verizon under Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, or FISA, amendments of 2008. Now, since PRISM is a covert program, Information about it has only come to light since Edward Snowden, an NSA contractor, disclosed documents revealing the extent and global reach of this particular mass data collection program. And while US government officials have defended the program by asserting it cannot be used on domestic targets without a warrant, that it has helped prevent acts of terrorism, and that it receives independent oversight from the federal government's executive, judicial, and legislative branches, the disclosed documents published by The Guardian and The Washington Post show that the NSA can and has unilateral access to data and performs in-depth surveillance on live communications and stored information. The NSA continues to engage in the original mission of the defunct Total Information Awareness Office to collect it all. That is, to acquire as much information as it can and maintain control over that information for as long as possible. The NSA has created a million square foot data mining complex in Bluffdale, Utah, that will house a 100,000 square foot mission critical, or does house, a mission, mission critical data center with the capacity to store well over a year's worth of the global internet traffic. As James Bamford, author of The Shadow Factory, the NSA from 9-11 to the eavesdropping of Amer on America notes, once it's operational, the Utah data center will become in effect the NSA cloud. The center will be fed data from the agency's eavesdropping satellites, overseas listening posts, and secret monitoring rooms in telecom facilities throughout the US. The amount of data, which includes domestic and foreign communications obtained from major ISPs, is staggering. NSA analysts can harvest 2.1 million gigabytes of data per hour with the help of the Titan supercomputer, which is capable of churning through more than 20,000 trillion calculations per second, 
or 20 petaflops. And one petaflop is one quadrillion instructions per second. That's a real number, quadrillion. <laughs> It is the evolution of intelligence gathering systems and the unprecedented computational power of intelligent machines that undergirds the development of planetary wide surveillance networks. What began as benign and be benevolent algorithmic governance is revealed to be the algorithmic Agartha, a hitherto hidden globally reticulated mass electronic surveillance architecture primarily driven by digital algorithms and machine-to-machine -machine communications. In our algorithmically driven information era, political, economic, and scientific control becomes a matter not just of the management of bodies and their wants, but a more subtle business of extracting and directing informational entanglements within any environment. Here, paraphrasing can work. Synarchically regulated society driven by digital techno mediation and the rising demand for developing and monetizing interactive virtual realities opens whole new vistas for the kinds of power that can co-opt and commercialize not only a human's bodily labor power through the interdisciplinary control of its work but also control the neurochemical and neuroarchitect and the neuroarchitectonic levels of information transmission that Lazzarato and Stiegler and our friend Scott Baker in his novel Neuropath and his three pound brain blog would call a neuro or noo politics. The algorithmic Agartha is thus governed synarchically by an electronic elite, this itself being one of the signs of the electrocene, of an already arrived post humanism in which human being itself becomes syntactically and syntechnically constituted by synarchically regulated missions, emissions, transmissions, transductions. As Alex Galloway and Eugene Thacker have reminded us in the exploit, today's <coughs> exploitation occurs informatically as well as corporeally. The biomass, not social relations, is today's site of explo exploitation. As Tim O'Reilly himself averse, Algorithmic regulation is more than just a metaphor. It is the mutable operational logic of a synarchically regulated planet-wide informational governance system. And while inv individuals, elites, interest groups, and governmental organs, all the normal and normative agents or actors are still conduits for synarchic regulation, the so-called transformative potential of today's informational paradigms is attributed almost exclusively to the processing power of algorithmic and not human intelligence. What up? <laughs> hey, we have about uh, 10 minutes or so for questions. Oh, oh, really? Went on and on. No, no, no. Oh, but uh, also, also uh, Amanda is going to be coordinating, Matt over here, is going to be coordinating the plenary discussion later. So some of this stuff might actually mm. resonate and trickle down throughout the day. But if anyone has a you know, preliminary interrogations they'd like to That was a bomb. Level. De detonated in your face. <laughs> <laughs> To, what's to this? To, to, to what? The, to the idea of control. Oh, okay. Like disagree with this yeah. kind of critique that exists in the media theory of robotics, etc. Mm -hmm. And um, I had an interesting conversation last month with a student of Gordon Basque, uh, Paul Pangara in New York, mm -hmm. who actually claimed that there was an understanding, especially around 
like biological computer lab, that Wiener didn't mean to use the word control when he defined cybernetics. That, <coughs> that he, what he meant was regulation, mm -hmm. not control. Yeah. And maybe in certain way they are the same, <coughs> but at the same time, like they kind of overemphasize something. So I don't know. So it's kind of like an interesting discussion: uh, control, regulation, algorithmic, and cybernetic. And so, how do you see the relationship mm -hmm. in all the things? Well, okay, I'll just, yeah. you, you, I'll let yeah. you answer, but I will just mention, I mean, it's interesting that, you know. She'll permit me. <laughs> yeah. no, well, um, thank you. I'm just, I will ultimately defer to you, but. Why? Yeah, all right. Well. All right, go ahead. Because, yeah. um, because you did the section on cybernetics. Mm, mm, mm. um, the difference between control and regulation. I mean, I see a difference in that, you know, Deleuze, in societies of control, the postscriptist societies of control, says that you know contra control today is free floating. So the kind of closed feedback loop of a uh, uh, cybernetic feedback back loop is not the model for societies of control. It's a it's a model for perhaps um, identifying certain regulatory mechanisms in specific um, instances. But so that would be one difference. But really, control doesn't work like that. It, control is much more free, free floating and modulated in societies of control. So I, I, thinking from that perspective, for me, regulation is far more rigid. And um, okay, I have a different perspective. That's yes, that's why I said ultimately. Okay, I, yeah. we should both so, answer yeah. this question. Because uh, you know, I, I thought it was interesting that they would be arguing that. Well, you know, Wiener wasn't didn't mean control, even though he put it in his title, and it was the hit the word he showed. But uh, so I'm not sure about. I can't speak to the Wienerian point so much, Wienerism. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I can speak to the idea of of um, algorithmic algorithmic governance and the and the and, and the way it's actually articulated by the O'Reillys of the world is very much in terms of regulation, but no, regulation is not control, uh, uh, as, letting, as letting the system kind of modulate itself. So, the re so it's a regulation and a management system more than a, you know, a, more than a, 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 a control system. So, I, this is, so I, in terms of the, I don't think regulation is as tight as-, as That's the, why I said I'm only speaking from the perspective that that I just outlined, but you're okay, right. Like yeah. Tim O'Reilly, basically, he himself says there's a difference between regulations and laws. Yes, yeah. and he doesn't really use the word control. Um, so he presents algorithmic governance as a freer way to understand regulation. So his notion of regulation is the old-fashioned kind of regulation where the state, you know, kind of oversees everything and screws everything up or whatever, you know, his idea is that if we let algorithms do their work, then the regulation will be built in and much more flexible. Um, mm. What I'm suggesting by bringing Deleuze in is that that is the prime model of a society of control. Mm. Mm -hmm. So did that's I, did why that the algorithmic question, governance or? is really algorithmic Agartha. It's just that Tim O'Reilly doesn't know it. Or maybe he does. <laughs> <laughs> so the fluidity and the flexibility of the algorithm would, in a sense, produce like a new and more total totalitarianism? So and the algorithm produces more algorithms. Mm -hmm. So what it's producing, if we just go back to the first part of the talk, is it's, pro it's the proliferation of the machine kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. It's an actual um, uh, evolutionary process. Yeah. Uh, so picking up on that, I guess I have a question about uh, resonance and attunement uh, in this. Um, and the question is basically, do we, how do we think about how this scales? Because right? um, it, it strikes mm -hmm. me that algorithms uh, technically often operate at a single scale. I mean, they can expand or, mm -hmm. or shrink, but the, the data point is more or less single scale. Right? Right. And, and scales up and down from a, a kind of baseline data. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just curious um, how, because I, I think there's a thought in this synarchy. Yes, that's uh, a, that's. Precisely this, but I want 
that's right. So the idea, so that's why we go back to this weirdo, yeah. right? Uh, and pull out the synarchic because the yeah because the 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 vision of synarchy uh, that we develop out of Saint Eve is one where uh, where all three points of that triangle, all three the triangulated this the soon the coming together is actually an uh, uh, allows for what I call switchcraft, right? Switching between logical parameters. So then you have whatever single point algorithms you have, you can actually quickly switch from one to the other and, and, and or overlap them. So you have, these, you have these switchings and combinations that are always in play and always available to a, to, to a governing or managing or regulatory system. Uh, the, uh, planet wide, we're, think, we're thinking as Ed would call it, post-planetarily. But that's why it's so important to bring in the concept of metis. Because the point is that you can think about scale from within each, log within the, each logical paradigm or discipline. But in order to govern all these disciplines from a perspective that is innocuous, or at least hidden, you need a different form of intelligence. Or and a each, different and, yeah. platform for, of intelligence. And all the algorithms static. unfold logically. But when you, when you do the metic metissage, right, you can actually take all these logical unfoldings and play them off against each other mm -hmm. and with each other, tune them to different tunings mm -hmm. and untune them, right? And, and so play upon tonalities, if that's kind of yeah, so bending it to here. Yeah, so, so like we were looking at, a, we, were, uh, we found a, a totally independent articulation of synarchic regulation in a chemist, chemist in a Rasmussen's, oh, what's his name? Howard Rasmussen. How, Howard Rasmussen's uh, Biochemical study. Biochemical yeah. signal transduction. And, uh, yeah. and, and it, was, uh, it was a very interesting, it had l very interesting forms and, t and strategies of, con he called it control, right? No, he called it regulations. So yeah. regulation. So you had you and he in, in, it allowed us to see many ways of putting into operation equilibrium, disequilibrium, harmony, or disharmony. Uh, these re, all these registers that we yeah. saw in Saint Eve's work. So so Saint Eve basically has one model, which is the 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 model in which philosophy and science will govern the other two domains of of control. But Rasmussen, in talking about cell transduction. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll offer seven of them. Mm -hmm. So we not only have what would be called hierarchical control, but we have coordinated control, we have antagonistic. Sometimes these three control mechanisms um, operate independently of one another. They don't have to get involved in each other's crap. But, but sometimes when friction within the informational environment in question uh, gets too frictive, uh, sometimes you'll have antagonistic control. So the scales, as, as you call them, I suppose, but Rasmussen kind of outlines them as these different, you know, me mechanisms under which we can understand the, per the various permutations that these three interactants can take. Yeah. So we, so we're just coming out with a paper that focuses on that, and we talk about the seven control systems. And it's a, it's a kind of useful way to look at um, the planetary governance of informational regimes today. Um, so, but, but we, what we essentially had to do is take this uh, bio, you know, biological, chemical um, schema and try to expand it. So that's kind of what we're working on right now. A really simple question, or the answer is probably obvious. But um, does it mean that sabotage is absolutely impossible? No, I. Oh well, no, I don't think so. Because of that, because of metis, I suppose. So, so yeah, you can, it, because you can you can uh, play off different algorithms or mechanisms. Uh, you can play them against each other. Um, you, you're able. Yeah, you can. De you can actually do. Uh, it's, it sounds it, like they continually recuperate. Not sabotage for the purposes of moksha or emancipation, yeah. ultimately. Oh, I don't know what the first word meant. It just means emancipation, liberation. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, it's a... It, I just mean difference. I mean, yeah, I mean yeah. sabotage when you put your finger or you 
Sure, you can sabotage. Yeah. And it, and it, but you will see that. In a way that sure, you can. Does not allow recovery. Well, that's the tough. That's it the tough up, part. Well, it opens up space <laughs> of another possibility. Yes, it opens up possibilities, but you'll find that the the machinic operation will always. Re it's like that Terminator. Uh, re you know, re re con re. What, a, what is that Terminator film? It. Yeah, it reassembles itself. You know, you think you've killed it. You think, ah, sabotage. But then it reconfigures itself and comes back. So, um, yes, you can have these moments yeah. where of so sub. So but the answer, yeah. no, really. the answer is yes and no. This, yeah, but mostly, you know, overall but no. Sabotage is always about tactical disruption. Yeah, yeah right? that's right. Um, I mean, you can you can use sabotage for some strategic plan of overthrow, but sabotage itself seems to me to be a you tactical you thing. Think um, like the whistleblowers, Shorter and Chelsea Manning mm -hmm. and Al, are in any way engaged in sabotage or are in any way successfully sabotaging operations? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I think Snowden is, okay. is, is okay. probably the most successful uh, of, of sabotage, saboteurs, but at the same time, you know, that's the whole point of synarchy, is that synarchy does not permit sabotage to uh, perpetuate anarchy. So it will yeah. always try to um, surround and recoup sabotage and, and regulate it uh, back into its um, yeah. systems of, of, of control. And also, you know, he has, I, I go to this, that, that where uh, you have the, the man in the gears. Oh, there's that's the, from there's the a, dictator. there's a, you know, yeah. there's the Snowden sabot is in there. You see his sandal in the gears and it's every kind, but the thing is the gears are still moving. Like he's, mm -hmm. you know, so we see it, it's something's brought to light, light, but it has, has it changed any of the mechanisms of, of regulation? I, and this is a question. Well, it hasn't changed algorithmic right now. No. no. So it's brought to light. So you see, you just see, you, he offers a perspective where you see a human being crushed by the gears, right? And you, and you start to see all the gears. And so that's, that's, the, that's a form of sabotage, right? That's where the sandal lies. Is it sabo a sandal? I don't even know. Clog, Clog yeah. Clog. Okay. He clogs the system. It's like a, yeah, like a horse. Like Temporarily. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I guess then my, my we gotta, we gotta kind of move on, but yeah. Yeah. I guess the one thing then based on what Geraldine just said, so, so is Métis always sort of doomed to be reactive? Uh, is there a way of kind of jumping ahead of the curve and actually? No, in fact, Métis in, in some senses is very offensive. It's not defensive. It's mm -hmm. not um, reactive at all. Um, it's proactive, yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> because what happens, is, and sabotage comes into it, but when you start thinking medically, you kind of have to go beyond the parameters of a logical, let's say, game board and kind of think between logics. Mm -hmm. And that's how you get out of the boundary of any one discipline or logos or problem. And so Sarah Kaufman mm -hmm. talks about this in her book, Comment ça s'assied, and for her, Metis is precisely, uh, she relates Metis to Poros and Aporia. Metis is exactly the form of intelligence that kicks in when you're, you find yourself in a situation where of logical impasse. But to tie this back to yeah. Butler and Frank Herbert, this is the, we're, the, the idea being advanced there is that the machine, the new regime, the new kingdom, is already that that is the mode of intelligence of the new regime. So the machine is metic, and the machine is me meti as well, metisage, and so the Latin and the Greek. Well, you, brought it, you started with um, uh, Peter Watt's novel, uh, Blind. You saw that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so the, there's, there seems there's, there's a, a difficulty with where, what, what does self awareness, yeah, uh, or where does self awareness fit into this, right? When in that novel, self awareness as Humans know it is is a glitch, right? Yeah. It is an evolutionary aberration. Yeah. And Intelligence happens. And the scramblers yeah. don't need self awareness. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. so. Yeah. However, we're talking about uh, Metis. Yeah. Um, as a, as a, as a way of being advanced, uh, or you use the word offensive, is is in, in advance of some kind of um, program. So we, so there's a question of saying, well, do we does, does Metis require not thinking, not thinking of the kind of intelligence that is not like what is governing. Uh, system or kingdom or does this the self-awareness as we know it which is glitchy which is a, an aberration 
how it, it, it seems like it's a, it's a bit of a bind with this, whether self awareness is a good thing. Mm-hmm. It's a tough, as, as yeah. The self awareness thing yeah. is a difficult one because metically, mm-hmm. right? If you're if you're playing in different regimes and you're playing different logics, I have a, <coughs> a official government self, like I have an official self that's on ideas. But I have se- I have the, the uh, self awareness on different. Uh, I have different selves. Mm-hmm. We all do, right? We have online selves and we have the offline selves, and we- so the the awareness the awareness you have metically is an awareness that you are. Always, you're always schized, schizo, and you can, you can operate different selves in different ways. You can coordinate yourselves, right, mm-hmm. in, different, uh, in different ways and play them off each but other. It's curious, but then there's no, there's no transcendental subject no. who coordinates that, right? That no. Is this, where is this? Where is this? So no. This is the weird thing about self-awareness. Well, so if we have multiple selves, who is coordinating that? No. Or is it just as machine as... That's right. right? The, the, well, the model of this intelligence I'm, uh, we're proposing is... It's a machinic one in a way. Well, in Mamoru Oshii's film, in fact, he suggests that self-awareness is a hindrance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a A it's something yeah yeah, it's something that actually uh, traps Mm -hmm. uh, human beings. And in fact, mechanical dolls, the gynoids, they don't have this problem. Yeah. And that's why he says, you know, kind of referring to Kleist, is that having no consciousness is kind of like having infinite consciousness. Hey, I, I, uh, I think that bringing up the blindside example is interesting too yeah. because one of the premises there is that self consciousness is energetically expensive. Mm-hmm. Yes. So I exactly. think that, you know, one of the things that Peter Watts is meditating on a lot is the question of whether human capacity for self reflection is just an evolutionary aberration or not mistake, but like exploration of one face, face potential, of yeah. self exactly. capacity, yeah. which isn't necessarily the most. Um, I, I think menace is also, to borrow a line from Deserto, when yeah. it's a coup, it's a coup that takes place at the right point in time. And yeah. I think that there are two ways of reading that. Like one would be to say, oh, if you can tell the punchline at the right moment, That's right. if you've chosen the right point in time. But That's I think right. the more interesting implementation of that idea is that it actually reframes temporal models. In time. That's right. Absolutely. In fact, uh, so Sarah Kaufman goes in that direction, yeah. highlighting the kairos, this, the, yep. the, the decisive oh, moment upon moment. which it turn, every, all and the turnings so are like... And so do And they right. do too, yeah. The time of Metis is not Kronos. No. Or Ion. I mean, it, it, it it's, is, but, it, it's, but critical, tech, it's critical yeah. point is the kairos, kairos, the decisive moment, as you say. But, yeah. but maybe that would be another way of rethinking the, the project of sabotage in general, because mm-hmm. you could yes. say, it's like, is the moment of sabotage to identify a moment in history which is the right moment for intervention? Mm. But Metis is not actually operating within that frame or model of time. Right. It's actually overthrowing that model of time, yeah. potentially, yeah. entirely. Um, so, I mean, I feel like that could be, in relationship to consciousness, that could be one question. I also would just mm-hmm. say that I've been thinking a lot about the energetic expense of self-reflection. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if we accept the model that self, the capacity to, to reflect upon self is energetically expensive, Yeah then we are always going to position it within an evolutionary framework, which questions how optimized it is. Mm-hmm. But it seems to me that it's possible that the capacity for self-reflection doesn't necessarily have to be energetically costly. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and mm. so, you know, mm-hmm. I just leave that as an open That's a good one, yeah, okay. That's very interesting. And I like thinking in terms of expenditure, uh, on the economic uh, part of the triangle there, you know, energy expenditure. Of all these, yeah, it's and it's an important, it's a totally important part of this anarchic way of approaching something. And also, really makes us have to rethink evolution too. The the word, the concept, uh, um, you know, because in some senses we're we're also subverting the way we're using the term evolution. Because you know, pure biologists will deny that evolution can be attrib- attributed to anything other than biological organisms, right? So, this idea of machine evolution doesn't make sense from that perspective, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, in, in some senses, maybe we can start rethinking the expenditure question, you know, partly by way of a re, metically rejigging the conceptual um, uh, timbre and resonance of the concepts that we're using and want to use. Mm. Okay. Right on. Well, thank thank you. you. Thank you.